The topic of don't give up on your dreams excites me, really excites me because I can remember when I was a little girl one day, when I was nine years old actually, I was standing in the living room and there was a television show on and Muhammad Ali was on the show. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad Ali was saying to somebody, I'm going to knock this guy out in the whatever round he said he was going to knock him out in. And I was just a little girl. I was nine years old. And I said, I wondered. I just kept, I couldn't let it go. I kept wondering, I wonder if he's actually going to do it. I wonder if he's going to do it. He said it was. So I said, Mom, I said, if you see it on TV that, you know, what happened at the fight, please let me know. I just want to know. Nobody else wanted to know. I wanted to know. A couple of days later, there he was on TV again, and he had actually knocked the opponent out in the round that he said. I, I was transfixed. I was just like, oh, how could he know he was going to do it like that? And even though I had other dreams, the biggest dream that I had started that day. I said, oh, Mom, I have to meet him. I have to. I have to meet Muhammad Ali. We have to talk. I just have to know why, how he knew that. And we have to meet. And so I started telling all of my friends, you know, I'm going to meet Muhammad Ali. Let me tell you this if you don't know anything about Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali is the most famous face on the face of the earth. It is said that... There's no place on earth that if you show his face, people won't say, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, they know that name, they know that face. And so I had a huge dream. There I was, nine years old, trying to meet Muhammad Ali. And I told everybody who would listen, not I want to meet him, I'm going to meet Muhammad Ali. You know, what did you want to be when you were up? Well, first I'm going to meet Muhammad Ali. And they look at me like, how on earth is she going to do that? But this really sticks out in my mind because as you heard Gwen say, I was a, I'm an English teacher. I always think of myself as a teacher. And when I was in the 11th grade, my English teacher had us write an assignment. And writing was always my favorite. I'm an English teacher. And the assignment was, what will you have done 10 years from now? I was so excited when she said that I could barely wait to get my paper out. I thought, oh my gosh, I can't wait. Nobody else wanted to write. I wanted to write. So I said, 10 years from now, I will have met Muhammad Ali. And I will have had dinner at his house. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Meeting him is one thing, but having dinner at his house, that's quite another. So my teacher, my wonderful teacher, got up. She had my paper. And she said, OK, class. This was in the Deep South, so I have to translate for you, maybe. She said, Diane C. wrote the best piper like she always does. <laughs> However, girls and boys, I want to tell you that this is what's called an unrealistic oh, expectation. No. This can't happen. Oh. It just can't. How can it? He said, okay, Dancy, stand up. So she had me stand up. She mm -hmm. says, okay, where are you going to meet him? You think he's coming to Alabama? I said, I really never thought about it. <laughs> well, okay, as famous as he is, he's the most famous, richest boxer in the whole world. Do you think he'll have security? I said, I honestly never thought about it. Don't you think he'll have an entourage? I said, I never really thought about it. And she said, so do you really believe he's coming to Alabama? I said, okay, where are you going to meet him, Dancy? I said, I don't know, but I will. And so she said, okay, okay, okay. Let's just say you see him somewhere like New York or somewhere. And let's just say you actually get to get up to him. And let's just say they let you through. And you shake his hand. Okay, maybe. How are you going to get to that man's house and have dinner? <laughs> so I said, I don't know, but I will. And she says, how? I said, I don't have to know. All I have to know is that it'll happen, and it'll happen. It didn't bother me at all that she didn't think it. It didn't bother me one bit that nobody believed it. I didn't care. I told everybody, when I meet, not if, when I meet Muhammad Ali, I can't wait to tell him what my teacher said. I know she's, he's going to find it amazing that she didn't believe we would meet. I never even considered that we would not meet, never for a second. I remember when I finished high school, one of my friends said, why don't we go to New York to spend the summer? I thought, she said he'd probably be in New York. Oh my gosh, yes, yes. I'll go to New York because in a big city like that, maybe that's where I'll meet him. Can you imagine a New York City with all the people there? I wasn't even thinking about that. I thought, I'll be in New York and I'll meet Muhammad Ali. Okay, we went to New York that summer. We were looking for jobs. 
And I passed by the, we passed by the NBC building, and I said, oh, NBC, I have to work there because the odds of Muhammad, he'll probably come in there. The Tonight Show was being taped there at the time. And I said, he'll probably be on the, I have to work for NBC. So my best friend said, why would they hire us? I don't think they would. I said, they'll hire me. She said, I don't think they'll hire me. And of course, you know what happened. Yeah. I got the job. And I got a job working for The Tonight Show, oh. organizing audiences for The Tonight Show. And let me just stop and say this. Your dream is like there's a magnet inside of you, and there's a magnet inside of your dream, and at all times, even when you don't know it, they're doing this. They're making their way toward each other. And it only wants one thing from you, and that's for you to believe it. If you believe it, it's going to keep doing this and doing this and doing this and coming closer and closer and closer. And you need to first have a dream. If you don't have one, it's never too late to get one. Have a dream. Number two, then believe in the dream. Number three, reach for it in whatever way that you can. You may not be able to go to another city. You may not be able to do something like that, but you can reach for it in your mind, wherever you're sitting, wherever you are in your room. You can sit there. I used to sit in my room, and I would sit at the table with Muhammad Ali at his house in my head, and we'd sit there, and I'd say, oh, Muhammad, this food is really delicious. Oh, Muhammad, let me just ask you. And I would sit there and laugh and talk with him in my head. I was always touching the dream in my mind. There was never a time when I wasn't. Okay, so there I was in New York working for The Tonight Show. And I remember when I was interviewed, uh, Al, who was head of the guest relations, said, um, guest relations department said, are there any celebrities that would, you know, cause you to just lose it? I said, one, just one. And he said, sure, you're not excited by celebrities. I said, I don't care about any of them, but one. And he said, which one? I said, if Muhammad Ali, when he walks, if he, come, if he comes, I'm not responsible for what, I'm not even going to try to pretend that I will know what I will do. That's the only one. So he said, okay, okay. He said, that's okay, you only have one. So every, I worked there that summer, did not meet him that summer. So I went back the following summer. I was working that summer as a tour guide. And as a tour guide, we stood in various shows. But I had connected with NBC, so they said they would hire me every single summer, so I was in. So that second summer that I was there working as a tour guide, this is what the girls used to do. You know, we'd go in at lunchtime, and they would say, guess who's going to be on The Tonight Show today? And somebody would say, yeah, Muhammad Ali. And I would literally not be able to breathe. I'd say, oh, God. Oh, are you serious? They'd be joking, of course. And after I had done everything that I could do, I would have cried, seriously cried. And then they'd all laugh and say, I know he's not. And then about three days later, somebody else would do it. Wouldn't you think? Every time they did it, I, oh, God, I believed it. I believed it every single time they did it. So one time, it was about the seventh time that they'd done it in a month, uh, a girl named Posey Cutler, I'll never forget it. She says, Jean, guess who's going to be on The Tonight Show tonight? And I said, oh, no, let me tell you, because I had decided that morning, I'm not doing this again. They <laughs> laughed. I mean, I should have sense enough to know that he's not on the show, and they know how I feel about it, and they, I won't do it again. I said, yes, Muhammad Ali, right? She says, oh, yeah, you knew Muhammad Ali. I said, of course, he's going to be on the show, and everybody wants to know what I'm going to do. She said, no, Gene really is. I said, of course he is. Now, you know that was the day that he really was going to be on the show, <laughs> but I didn't believe it. And as I walked out of the uh, little lounge that we were in, I walked away, and I thought, but Posey's never played that joke on me before, so maybe he really is going to be on the show now. I know it's not. Well, just in case he is, you know, I'm going to go up and look on the door because they'd have a star on the door with his name on it. I said, well, I'll just go up and see. So I went up just like a regular person, and I got up on the floor, and I looked, and there the star was with his name on it and a wall, thank God, close by. I fell against the wall. Oh, God! And the people were all around like, what's wrong? I said, nothing. I'm looking and pointing at his name, and I'm in tears. So one of the people working there said, well, let me just tell you where he'll be entering the building so that you can go down. They didn't even expect me to work the rest of the day. I thought, I don't care if I lose my job behind me. I have to be in place. So I went downstairs, and I was standing by a booth. And so help me. I'm standing there, almost in tears at the thought of meeting him. And he walks in the door with an entourage, about five people, actually. And I was, I, seriously, it was so difficult to stand. And, and tears were just streaming down my face. Oh, and let me digress for a moment. My teacher said, how are you going to meet him? And I said to her, he'll want to meet me too. 
She said, why? I said, I don't know, but he will. He'll want to meet me as badly as I want to meet him. He'll want to meet me. She says, why? I said, he will. So he's walking toward me, and I'm standing there. I, oh, Lord, I'm praying, and I'm trying, and I'm crying. And he walked over directly to me. He's coming straight to me. And he looked like he was sprayed with famous spray and <laughs> good looking spray and all kind of spray because he wasn't like normal people. In my mind, he looked like he was 20 feet tall and he's walking toward me. I'm standing there shaking and he walked to me and he attempted to put his hand on my shoulder. I told him, no, don't, no I'm not ready for you to touch me. No, do, 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 do not. He touched me anyway. I'm like, oh God. And I'm crying and he said, are you doing all of that over me? And I said, yes. He said, you want to meet me that badly? And I said, yes. I wanted to meet you since I was nine years old. And I started to tell him about it. And then he said, well, if you want to meet me that badly, guess what I'm going to do? I'm, since I'm going to be on the Tonight Show, and we're all going to go to dinner afterwards. You're invited to go to dinner with us. Take one of your friends with you, and I'm going to take you to dinner. And I was in uniform, because I was a tour guide. And he said, so come on up. And we went up to the Tonight Show floor. And everybody was like, I, I was like, Oh God, I was still, I could barely stand. And he was smiling and he hugged me. And I, t I kept warning him, don't, you know, because I could barely take it. And then one of my friends, I invited her to go with us to dinner. And so when he went in to take the show, we were standing right outside of the studio. So when my other friend was in a uniform as well, we looked like airline stewardesses, those type of uniforms. And she says, okay, so now that he's taking the show, we can go and change clothes and get back. I said, are you kidding? change clothes. I'm not leaving this spot. Oh, no. I've waited since I was nine years old. I'm not leaving this spot. And so she changed clothes. I said, you have to bring my bag. I'm not, I will not get my bag. I'm not going. I'm not leaving this spot. So he came out. He took us to dinner. And we sat at the table with him. And they put a phone there. He allowed me to call my mother. He allowed me to, because I wanted everybody to know. I said, Mama, Mama, you won't believe this? And she says, yes, I will. What is it? I says, Mom, and I'll leave. She says, okay, baby, let me speak. She, she caused me to believe the way I did. It didn't matter what the teacher said. It was too late because my mother, Katie, had already gotten to me. She said, you can do what you want to do. All you need to do is believe it. And so I didn't care what anybody else said. He let me talk with her, several of my other best friends. He let me talk with his wife because I wanted to meet her also. And I talked with her on the phone. Everybody was excited for me. After we had met, then I went back to all my friends and they said, girl, it came true. And I said, yes. And oh, we did take a picture together. Uh, I have that little snapshot. I wish I'd had time to find it. I will next time maybe have it with me. But everybody said, your dream came true. I said, no, part of my dream came true. And I said, Gene, you had dinner with Muhammad Ali, the most famous man in the world, and your dream didn't come true. I said, I want to have dinner at his house. And then everybody started to think, oh, now, Gene. Now, Gene, Gene, Gene. How do you expect that to happen? I said, I don't know. So he moved to California. Just look at the magnets. At, at, I finished college. I moved to California. He was in California. And I said, oh, God has put us in the same place because I guess I'm having dinner at his house in California. I was invited to a party given by a songwriter for Diana Ross. By then, I had finished college, and I was thinking all of the things that I suppose young girls think. Who am I going to marry? What am I going to do in life? And all of that. Went to the party. There were all kinds of celebrities there. I didn't even want to go to the party, by the way, but the magnet was pulling. My friend begged me to go. And I said, I don't want to go. I just don't feel like going. She begged and begged. I went. Went to the party. There were football players there, basketball players, famous singers, so many singers, writers, and one undefeated heavyweight boxer named Marty Monroe. That's why I'll never forget your name. <laughs> Marty Monroe. Marty Monroe thought he was going to be interviewed by someone. No, he was going to be interviewed by someone at the party. He and I started talking, and I don't know why he thought I was interviewing him. We were talking about boxing, and I was asking so many questions, and he thought I was interviewing him. And then, in the end, he said, well, aren't you going to tape it? And I said, why would I? And he <laughs> said, are you going to remember all of this? And I said, yes, I will. Big mix-up. I went into another room. He walked in the room. He, he, finally, he found out that I was not interviewing him. We talked about Muhammad Ali and all of that. And he, it was a big mix-up. OK, I went in the other room. He came in there and he said, I'm glad that you're not interviewing me. And I said, why? By then, I had a degree in English. He said, because there's something I need to tell you. I said, you haven't known me long enough to need to tell me anything. I said, maybe you want to tell me something? He said, no, I need to tell you something. I said, OK, what do you need to tell me? He said, you're my wife. 
Oh. <laughs> I said, I'm your what? He said, you're my wife. Oh. I became his wife. Oh. That's our daughter. <laughs> That's why I won't forget her name, Marty. As a result of me becoming his wife, Joe Frazier, the legendary Joe Frazier oh, nice. at that time, was his manager. A series of events occurred where I was in the boxing gym every day. I became his manager. After we were married, he, Marty and I were riding down the street one day. Someone flagged us down and said, Marty, Marty, we've been trying to get in touch with you. And, and he said, why? What is he? he said, Muhammad Ali is trying to reach you. <laughs> I said, Muhammad Ali's trying to reach me, why? He's now, he has a company called Muhammad Ali Professional Sports, and they want to promote your career. I became a boxing manager. At one time, I was the only female boxing manager in Muhammad Ali's Deer Lake training camp. From that nine-year-old dream, I was the only female boxing manager in his camp at one time. I used to have breakfast with him. And yes, I had dinner at his house. I sat at his table and told him, I said, Muhammad, do you know how many times I've sat at your table in my mind and I've eaten dinner with you? I never thought I'd have breakfast, because I, I, but the dream was about dinner. It wasn't about breakfast. In the camp, he and I used to actually eat breakfast together in the mornings and sit and talk. And one evening, I was at his house with my husband, and I was telling him about my dreams. And he said, Gene, you remind me of myself, because I was a dreamer. As a little boy, I said I was going to become champion of the world. Nobody believed it. He said, I told Ray Robinson, who was the greatest champion who ever lived, I, he said, I walked in and I said, Ray, I'm going to be heavyweight champion of the world. And he said, well, all little boys say that. He said, you know, everybody says that. He said, so I was just like you. I was a dreamer. So I said all of that to say this. There is no dream too big for you. There's no such thing as a dream that's too big. If you can conceive it, if you can believe it, you can achieve it. So as you're about to spread your wings and fly out into the world, don't let anybody say, oh, but you can't do that. You can't meet that person. Oh, no. Oh, yes, you can. Because I'm living proof that you can. And what happens is that the dream becomes bigger than even your little conception that you had at first. It becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Nobody could have told me at nine years old, not only will you meet him, have dinner at his house. That's all I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to do anything. If he had just invited me to dinner at his house and said a restaurant, the dream would have been over. But no. As a result of that one little dream, that one little seed that I watered in my mind by thinking of it daily, it came true. And it's one of the biggest dreams that ever happened in my entire life. So if mine can come true, so can yours. All right.